grazie a Santo Presidente Gennaro per la opportunità unica e straordinaria di essere qui con tutti voi oggi. Per me è per me molto importante parlare in italiano. Io non posso. So, io sono spiacente in inglese. Per favore. Grazie. One of the things that um, I appreciate most about being ambassador in this great country is that we can come together at places like Chisa in a spirit of partnership to talk about important issues and to draw on experts from both sides of the Atlantic to find collaborative ways to move forward. So thank, thank you all for being here. Our outstanding military officers, thank you. Our great thinkers, thank you. I appreciate so much your being here. I've spoken here before. I've spoken about the historic transatlantic alliance. And I'm especially pleased today because it marks the 70th birthday, several days from now, of NATO. So let me highlight, which the Presidente did so well, that which is the source of our collective strength. Indeed, there are strong pillars on which our alliance stands. It stands on democracy. It stands for freedom, freedom of the individual. Importantly, it stands for the rule of law and ultimately for the peace and prosperity not only of its partners and members, but for the world. The United States, Italy, and 10 others, a total of 12, gathered in Washington on April 4, 1949, to reaffirm, and I quote from the preamble of the North Atlantic Treaty, their desire to live in peace with all peoples and all governments. The Atlantic Alliance has since grown, and we have grown stronger with our new members. We especially welcome those who courageously freed themselves from tyranny. In that vein, NATO's door remains open to new members. We look forward to welcoming North Macedonia soon, and our family of shared values will spread. And with each new member, we renew our unquestionable commitment to collective defense in Article 5, and we pledge to protect the principles of Article 2, which is to defend free institutions and to promote stability and prosperity. Consider the world for a moment after the war. In 1948, Soviet forces blockaded rail, road, and water access to Berlin, Germany. The United States led the response to deliver food and fuel in what is now known as the Berlin Airlift. And against that backdrop, NATO was born, and the Soviet blockade, as we must all know, ended shortly thereafter. So together, we share that unflinching defense of liberty and free enterprise it vanquished a regime of undeniable, unforgiving, and soul-crushing oppression. In 2019, we actually celebrate, at the same time, the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. It was built in 1961. Its pieces now lay in museums for longer than it cast its dark shadow over all of Europe. NATO deployments have made lasting contributions to global peace and security, and they will continue to do so. Twenty years ago, NATO stopped ethnic cleansing in Kosovo and saved untold lives of defenseless civilians. And most recently, allies invoked Article 5 after September 11, 2001, in defense of the United States. 
I might take a minute to share with you the unusual impact and meaning it had for me personally. On September 11th, 2001, on a beautiful day like today, I was destined to leave my post and my office, which was on the 67th floor of World Trade Center One, having been responsible in August, the month before, of completing a long-term lease on those very buildings. By some act of fate, I stopped to meet a colleague who was facing a difficult time for a cup of coffee. And I was removed from the cafe by Port Authority police who informed me that our towers had been struck. The rest of it is hard history. It has had me reflect often. I spent the next 90 days on what was then called Ground Zero, or the rubble. It depended from where you came, how you referred to that site. And I was appointed to chair a committee for the family of victims. It was the hardest task of my life, but had me decide, made a life-changing decision as I signed up to help rebuild the World Trade Center in the downtown area, that I was in a fortunate place where I could leave my business and to the extent possible dedicate my life to trying to make sure that the terror that had struck on 9-11 would not strike again and to do what I could to protect the lives of my children, my grandchildren, your children, and your grandchildren. And so, on that day, Article 5 took on, and for the first time and only time in history, all the members of NATO, in fact, most of the countries in the world, came to our defense. My gratitude and the United States' gratitude for those acts of spirit and toil and defense will always remain. The United States is so grateful to many, but to Italy for its enduring leadership in Kosovo, which again had the possibility of causing great problems, and the sacrifice and the shared fight against terror in Afghanistan. We thank you, Italy. You were always there. We will never forget. The Cold War is over, but NATO is as relevant perhaps more relevant than it was in 1949. New challenges combine with the old ones. The geopolitical environment is increasingly competitive. Therefore, each of us knows that we owe it to our citizens and each other to invest in our security. In the last two years, we've made real progress as an alliance. You probably haven't noticed, but President Trump has continuously called for everyone to share in the burden of defense and meet that famous 2 percent of GDP commitment that was signed onto in the Wales Accord in 2014 to reach the 2 percent level by 2024. <coughs> Since that call went out, since 2016, actually, European allies in Canada have spent an extra $41 billion on defense, and by 2020, we are on the road to an increase to $100 billion. Investing in defense means prioritizing modernization, like the F-35. Italy and its state in a state-of-the-art production facility at Comedy and cornerstones and the Joint Strike Fighter Program are taking a meaningful step. If, if you haven't already and you're interested in seeing it, I urge you to go visit the amazing facility at Comedy and the incredible defense aircraft that Italy 
can and is building on its own, with its own engineers, with its own people, with the Italians learning and taking over the production of this incredible, incredible machine. The F-35 is cutting-edge technology, and as Italy takes advantage of building it, the opportunity to sell that aircraft and create many jobs and profits for Italy is outstanding. There is no other facility like this in Europe today. Let me switch gears and speak for a moment about something I truly believe is to everyone's best interest. It would be great for the United States. It would be great for peace in the world, and it would be great for Russia if the two great countries could join hands and work together for peace and prosperity. Unfortunately, that cannot happen while acts of aggression continue until Russia adheres to their signing of the Minsk Accord, withdraws from the Donbass where already over 10,000 lives had been lost and continue to fight. But instead, if they were sign and move towards peace and work with us, how much we could do in the world. But the aggression and the regression from that kind of working together seems far away. Take the Intermediate Range Nuclear Force Treaty. The United States compiled a trail of four years of Russia violating that treaty, and we presented that to all of our allies. And recognizing that we could not be alone adhering to that treaty, we withdrew and we await for Russia to correct its actions so that we may come back in force together and combined respect the treaty. As President Trump stated, Russia left no choice but for us to withdraw. We can't be the only country that adheres to the treaty. But the alliance remains united on this, while remaining open to effective international arms control, disarmament, and nonproliferation as the goal. There are those who call for removing sanctions on Russia now. Voices I hear every once in a while. Despite Russia's failure to improve its behavior. So I ask, what should we deduce from those calls to remove sanctions? Have, are we missing something that they condone the Kremlin's invasion of Crimea, that they condone Russian troops in eastern Ukraine, which has produced one of the worst humanitarian crises, as I mentioned, do those voices seek to justify Russia's invasion of Georgia in 2008? Can they overlook the fact that the Kremlin-backed assassins deployed a military-grade nerve agent on British soil? And how do they justify Russia's attack near the Kerch Strait on November 25th? It was a dangerous escalation, clearly a violation of international law, and unconscionable that, as I speak, Ukrainian ships, moreover its sailors, remain in Russian custody. So NATO allies agree, and the voices who say otherwise must answer. We have always continued dialogue. Dialogue has not stopped. Dialogue between Russia and the United States dialogue between the best interlocutors in the world from Italy has not ceased. The best diplomatic tool to bring Russia back to compliance that we have right now, because no one wants war, is compliance with the values that all NATO members share. We don't want war. We cannot accept the brazen violations, however, of international law and the norms that they represent. Inaction has never been and is not now an option, and it's clear 
that dialogue has proved to be insufficient. Relax, relaxing sanctions now without any positive change in behavior would send the absolute opposite message and likely encourage further provocations. The coordinated response on March 15th among the United States, EU, and Canada to impose sanctions was a clear and well-presented message. We cannot forget these provocations. We cannot return to business as usual. And the international community cannot stand by while they are violating international norms and laws. So the time to grasp hands and work together for peace stands a short distance away, adhering to and the working towards an already stated accord. Russia is not the only international threat to NATO. An increasingly assertive China is seeking to subvert European and transatlantic unity. Our president, our administration, and our government is committed to maintaining peace through strength. He understands that our economic strength and our capacity to innovate gives us a strategic advantage. There is no doubt that democratic free market societies have lifted millions upon millions out of poverty like never before. There is no doubt, there is no doubt that China maintains an authoritarian approach it is antithetical to the freedom of nations. With a leader for life and a communist government, its philosophy does not stand on those pillars that we share of democracy, freedom, rule of law. All of us want to do business with China. It's a rapidly growing economy. Italy is not alone in wanting to do business. Although we are now conscious and share the concern for Italy's security and our combined security in NATO as being a singular priority to adhere to and to be careful to guard. So we must, with each other, share that security. There are cyber threats that exist. And so we appreciate the fact that in the MOU that was signed, although we would have preferred that clearly that Italy not be the first G7 nation to sign up with the Belt Road. We know and appreciate the fact that they removed 5G from discussion, and we hope that it lays a pathwork for us all to develop a, a common and clear way. Secretary Pompeo explained, Pompeo explained that the United States may not be able to share information with those coming into its critical information system, some of, the some of the Chinese 5G technologies. So decisions about infrastructure for 5G will indeed have a long-term implication, and there's no need to run full speed into making that decision. The privacy and the liberty of our citizens is at stake, and we are seriously concerned there could be consequences to the inoperability for our NATO alliance. We're confident capitalism will prevail in competition and don't operate according to where the others are not working according to international rules. In addition to Russia and China, although we have made outstanding progress in our fight against terrorism and are claiming that 100 percent of the caliphate has been removed, we cannot deny that the threat exists. It is evident that NATO's transatlantic and southern security concerns are linked more than ever before in the alliance's history. The United States, Italy, and 77 other countries of the global coalition to defeat ISIS liberated all that territory, but we know that ISIS remains in Iraq and Syria. With their strongholds eliminated, terrorist fights are now returning to North Africa and to the Sahel. They are searching for safe havens from where they can plot attacks on members. These challenges make NATO's cooperation more, not less, important than ever before. 
Italy and the U.S. agree we must cooperate more closely to address the threats in the Mediterranean region. We applaud Italian initiative by coasting NATO's hub for the South in Naples. Our mutual concerns were the impetus for the United States and Italy to form a strategic dialogue that President Trump and Prime Minister Giuseppe Conte launched at the White House in July 2018. Through this forum, we continue to deepen the very important U.S.-Italian partnership. We are grateful and appreciative for Italy's leading role in NATO and the generous hospitality extended to 30,000 U.S. military families, civilian personnel, and our armed forces. Our armed forces serve shoulder to shoulder in Afghanistan, Iraq, Kosovo, and around the world to advance peace and security. I know Secretary Pompeo is excited to host allied counterparts, including Foreign Minister Moavro Milanese in Washington for the NATO Foreign Ministerial tomorrow and the day after. On the eve of NATO's 70th anniversary, I would like to recall President Harry Truman's words at the time of the signing of that treaty. I quote, we are not only seeking to establish freedom from aggression and from the use of force, but we also are actively striving to promote and preserve peace throughout the world. Our sovereign states are devoted to defending these principles without diluting our independence or our unique national identities. Seventy years later, the Atlantic Alliance is more essential than ever. We are united in protecting freedom and promoting peace and prosperity. We condemn authoritarian aggression. We remain unyielding in our defense of a fair marketplace. And we are committed to combating terrorism and addressing threats in the Mediterranean. In closing, we must stand together for the values that built an unbreakable bond and continue. A colleague of mine did a little research, and he found out that the average treaty over the last 500 years has lasted 15 years. The Alliance Treaty of NATO, celebrating its 70th, is the longest existing multi-nation alliance in the last 70 years. So we must stand together for the next 70 years and beyond, and we should stand together with our heads held high and our hands outraged because we must stand together for democracy, for freedom, for the rule of law, and for peace and prosperity in the world. Thank you for this opportunity. God bless Italy. God bless America. God bless you all.